All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special treat in store for you today. I am sitting right now with one of the best guitarists in Sabaton. And that's me, Tommy Johansson, and you are watching Sabaton History Channel. It gladdens me to know that Odin makes ready the benches for a banquet. Soon we shall be drinking ale from the curved horns. The champion who comes into Valhalla does not lament his death. I shall not enter his hall with words of fear upon my lips. The gods will welcome me. Death comes without lamenting. Eager am I to depart. The Valkyries summon me home. Those whom Odin sends for me from the halls of the Lord of Hosts. Gladly shall I drink ale in the high seat with the gods. The days of my life are ended. I laugh as I die. The Saga of Ragnar Lothbrok For a long time. The early history of Northern Europe was shrouded by a fog of mystery. There was a marked gap in knowledge of Europe in the years between the fall of the Roman Empire and the full spread of Christianity. And this era was simply accepted as the Dark Ages, as an era before general literacy, when Northern Europe was ruled by savage and fearsome heathens. Those heathens, however, did leave behind their sagas, their tales of great adventures and battles. Scandinavian archaeologists of the 19th century were confronted with a confusing jigsaw puzzle of burial mounds, cryptic runestones, and medieval scriptures. But then in 1880, a breakthrough was at hand with the discovery of the Gokstad Mound in Norway in a ship buried a thousand years earlier, next to a large pile of shields, swords, and jewelry, lay a man that reignited the interest in a long-forgotten age. He was huge for his time, over 180 centimeters tall, a chieftain who had most likely met a violent death in battle. The embodiment of a Viking. You know, for a long time, Scandinavian scholars had seen the Viking Age as the end phase of the Germanic Iron Age. Too little was known to be precise, and even the word Viking was of questionable origin. Most historians refer to the Old English word Vikinga, which was repeatedly used to reference warriors coming from the sea in Anglo-Saxon chronicles. It was also the British who gave their history a distinct local Viking age, right? From the first violent raids on their shores in 793 to the Battle of Hastings in 1066. If we asked a Swedish pagan in those times, where his origins lay, we might have gotten an answer similar to those we'd get from the Icelandic Edda, a compendium of Norse folktales, that once there was a time where worlds were not only divided by light and darkness, but by deep chasms from which the giants ruled, until Odin, the all-father of the gods, slew the giant Ymir, whose flesh gave birth to the land and whose blood turned into the sea. On their journeys and in war, the pagans looked to Odin for guidance and blessings. He was the god of war, who sends his favor to the bravest of them. But, like the Vikings themselves, Odin was not single-minded. He was also the god of poetry and the god of wisdom. Once he sacrificed his own eye to bring pagans the knowledge of the language of the runes. Such rune stones can still be found all over Scandinavia, and although the pagans were otherwise illiterate, they give us a little insight into important people or local customs. Outside of battle, the pagans honored Thor, the god of thunder. As the patron of the farmers, he rode the sky in his chariot, bringing thunder and lightning down as a sign of power. Scandinavian metal workers crafted jewelry and amulets in the form of Thor's mighty hammer to attract his protective powers. It was the belief of the pagans that the worlds of gods and men were connected, and although the fate of each man had been decided at his birth, the gods could still intervene and change fates along the way. And the northern gods were no super ethical or morally upright beings. They were flawed and at times even treacherous and ruthless in the pursuit of their goals. They watched and they cheered as men toiled and struggled and it became the pagan way to live with this feeling of cosmic order and worldly chaos, of predestined fate and yet personal responsibility showing courage, 
taking risks, the will to sacrifice, all these were essential parts of Norse culture. There was no place for weakness or cowardice because everyday life in Scandinavia was harsh. Far away from the civilizations that had been touched by the Roman Empire, it was hardly the place to sustain a, a laid-back lifestyle. People stayed loyal to their communities through personal oaths, and laws manifested themselves through societal pressure. Deals, threats, and promises had to be made in public so that no party could back out without bringing shame on their name and their family. In the dark winter months of Scandinavia, each man was obliged to show hospitality to his fellows, which resulted in feasts that often lasted for days, and there, poets and musicians, skulls, recited and sang tall tales of their revered ancestors, of the gods and of their heroes. It inspired men to make a name for themselves, so that the skulls would one day sing of their deeds as well. The bravest of them might even find a way to ascend into the halls of the gods themselves. Life on Scandinavia's coast made the Norsemen top-notch seafarers. They invented the keel, which was quite the nautical breakthrough as it allowed ships to cross oceans. Their famous longships were, were sleek and sturdy ships, perfect for traveling large rivers. With such ships, the men ventured out. Some wanted to trade, others sought a new place to live, a few were exiled or on the run, but the bravest, and the hungriest of them all, they went viking. The world was laid out in front of them, and it was theirs for the taking. The Danes and Norwegians ventured south and west. With fire and sword, they raided across the Frankish coast and deep into Charlemagne's realm. Here, they became the ferocious Northmen, and their impact on Frankish society was immense. Tall and broad pagan warriors fought and slaughtered their way through northern France. The Christians saw them as God's punishments, as harbingers of the apocalypse. Each successful raid attracted more pagans to the Viking lifestyle, though, and especially imposing chieftains became sea kings, lords without a country but with enough money and power to lead expeditions in pursuit of plunder. Their seemingly endless ambitions took them up the River Seine to lay siege to Paris itself. Other sea kings went further west, towards Britannia and Ireland. From the first raids on Anglo-Saxon monasteries to the full-scale invasion, a great heathen army landed in 865 and plundered and raided its way from Northumbria to Wessex and threatened to take over all of England and turn it into Daneland. Heroes larger than life had appeared. Legends like that of Ragnar Lothbrok, Torgils the Devil, or Ivar the Boneless. Skalds sang of unshakable shield maidens or the secret warrior brotherhoods like the Jomsvikings in the Baltic Sea. And another popular tale was that of Rurik and the Rus. While the Vikings from the shores of Denmark and Norway usually traveled westwards, the Swedish pagans went south and east across the Baltic Sea. Archaeological evidence shows that the Swedes had formed colonies in Corland and on the Baltic coast as early as 750. Swedish Vikings soon took over a major fort at Lake Ladoga, which opened the way to the vast river network of western Russia. But unlike the British or Frankish shores, there were few riches to be found there, no monasteries or wealthy towns to be plundered, so they traveled southward in their sleek longships, sliding down the Volga and Dnieper towards the realms even beyond the Black Sea, laden with goods like amber, swords, honey, tusks, furs, or wax. They sought to exchange them for silver and silks. Most profitable, however, was the slave trade. Captured Slavic girls were sold for high prices in the slave markets of the Byzantine Empire in exchange for Greek or Arabian coin. Navigation down the major rivers was hazardous and the surrounding country treacherous. Semi-nomadic tribes like the Khazars watched the Northmen with suspicion. Many other tribes saw the Vikings as intruders and there was never a guarantee that even those who had shown them hospitality on the way south might not lay in ambush on the way back. But this was the Viking way. Scandinavian merchants traveled with their bodyguards, a sworn group of men, armed to the teeth and united in their belief that they could only trust each other. The journey was long and many did not return, but those who did 
did so as rich men. The writings of Islamic and Byzantine scholars tell us of these men who call themselves the Rus or Varangians. I have seen the Rus as they came on their merchant journeys and encamped by the Volga. I have never seen more perfect physical specimens. Tall as date palms, blonde and ruddy, they wear neither tunics nor kaftans. But the men wear a garment which covers one side of the body and leaves a hand free. Each man has an axe, a sword and a knife and keeps each by him at all times. The swords are broad and grooved, of Frankish sort. Every man is tattooed from fingernails to neck with dark green or blue-black trees, figures, etc. It is the custom of the king of the Rus to have with him in his palace 400 men, the bravest of his companions and those on whom he can rely. These are the men who die with him and let themselves be killed for him. The name Rus probably stemmed from the term Ruotsi, a name the Finns gave the Swedes. It simply translates to men who row, you know, which is after all pretty accurate, right? Those Rus traveled from the far north down to Constantinople, which they called Miklagard, the great city. A group of Varangians even served the Byzantine emperor as warriors for hire. Others traveled even further down the Caspian Sea towards Baku, the city of fire. That trading route, although very dangerous, was also extremely profitable. Back in Scandinavia, archaeologists have found hordes of foreign gold coins and even rings made of ivory. Over time, the Swedish Vikings of the Rus and Varangians built outposts and colonies along the way. They joined forces with the local clans and made alliances against common enemies. Over the decades, the Rus mixed with the locals, adapted local customs, wore their colorful kaftans and their chieftains called themselves khans. They often converted to Judaism or Christianity, and it was they who eventually laid the foundation for the Kievan Rus, the realm that Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus all claim as their forefathers, their cultural ancestors. Nowadays, Vikings are more popular than ever. I don't think anyone back in the 19th century would have predicted that early Scandinavian culture would rise to such prominence. In fact, I think they would be very, very surprised. So Tommy, first of all, I gotta say, it's a real honor for me to be able to sit here with Literally, I mean, we're not kidding. One of the best guitarists in Sabaton. I, I mean, I, I can't imagine how you feel. Can you? Yeah. Because it's an awesome feel, and it's great to have you on the show. Um, I, I hope it wasn't too much trouble flying in and all with COVID and stuff. <clears throat> and, you know, well, take... it was a bit of a hazard, but I mean, I'm here now, so it's all in the past. I'm just glad to be a part of the show. Well, and it's also because it's a special episode. That's why we wanted something really special. Because, now you might not know this, but this is actually true. Swedish Pagans is likely, I haven't counted, but every single time people write Swedish Pagans, I think it's probably, possibly the most requested song that we do an episode about. Really? Really, which is wow. interesting because it's a you know, bonus track. Yeah, I didn't know that. Well, how do you feel about the song? <clears throat> well, it's one of the most requested songs live. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, but w why is that? Why do you think people have this thing for it? Well, because it's a great song. And it's a great song. And, yeah. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and um, then why is it a bonus track then? Why wasn't it a... a, a proper track well <clears throat> to be completely honest indy yeah i was not a part of sabaton when that song was written but you must know the tales whispered on the night winds and those tales are legends yeah <laughs> yes. okay so make well, one up <laughs> oh okay so here here it is uh they thought that this song no one is gonna like this song so really? but yeah but we recorded the song so they put it on the uh, on the on the album as a bonus track and thought well no one will recognize this song or re remember this song or even listen to it but then people start to listen to it and the rumors are starting to spread all over the the land about yeah. this one song the song of all songs called Swedish Pagans and it reached the crowd during a Sabaton show someone in the distance the singer of all songs would sing oh and oh. people would turn around and say hey 
I know that melody yeah. from that bonus track. And they start to sing along. And the band on stage were standing there like, what? They're singing this song? Yeah. This bonus track? What is this? And do we know that song? Yeah, sure. Okay, let's play it. Yeah. And from that day on, the song was played on every Sabbath and show. Almost. So when you joined the band, what was the first song, not songs that you guys were coming, new songs, what was the first old song that you had, to, that you learned? Like maybe for a tryout or maybe... To, did it... I don't remember because, I mean, I was listening a lot to Sabaton. <laughs> you were going to say, I was really high. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas says, no, the new hashtag. Yeah. Use it and you will stay away from drugs. Yeah, use yeah. that hashtag to stay away from drugs. Yes. I'm glad we had this time. <laughs> so anyway. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, so I knew a lot of Sabaton songs, actually. Um, I don't remember because I got all the songs and they told me to listen to these guitar files uh, because I had Tobes guitars. Sure. Uh, so I listened to them and sort of played, learned the songs. But most of them I, I knew already right. the, the basics for. But I think the one I really started to learn, you know, properly was the, the, to learn the proper way how to play it was uh, Atero Dominatos. Okay. Wow. Well, cool. Yeah, because it's uh, one of my one of my favorite yeah. Sabaton songs from the old days. So I learned to play that. And <clears throat> to be honest, I listened to the guitar parts on Prima Victoria <laughs> and I realized, okay, I know this one already. So I didn't even practice that one. Okay. Uh -huh. Because I knew it already. But, but And when you started doing songs like Atero Dominatos, old, older songs and stuff, would you be required to play like the original solos note for note? Or did you get to do your own? Or did you do come to some compromise? Or how did that work? Well, it was kind of a compromise because I listened to the original songs. Yeah. And then I listened to how Tuba played the right. songs, how, the, how we played the solos, and how we did certain parts. And I realized, okay, here he plays like the original, so I should stick to that. Right. And here he plays something completely different. So, so I could either play what he does or do something new. Well, that's pretty cool. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, because some solos from the old songs are very, you know, very nice, very cool solos. We don't need to change it. Yeah. But then maybe when they're doing something fast, too bad did something different, and I feel okay. I can I can space out here and do. Uh, something well, it's nice to have some freedom. I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously freedom. You have it on the songs that you yeah. are the first guitarist. Uh, yeah. And, stuff. and you know what's surprising? I mean, as many people will know, especially just by looking at you and by your hair, you come from a smoky jazz background, like jazz flute and stuff, right? Uh, so yeah. I thought that was kind of cool that they asked you to play guitar of all instruments, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, hashtag Tommy plays flute. That's a popular one as well. And we can probably get some pictures of him <laughs> playing flute. But Swedish pagans, obviously, yeah. you're, 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 you're from Norland. Yes. You know, you're a big sort of hairy Viking guy. Hashtag Viking guy. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, okay, now, it's interesting how the world looks at, you know, the whole Viking period and the yeah. period of uh, How would that compare with how Swedes see it themselves? Because well, the world sees horny helmets. Well, I mean, Swedes are very proud of the Vikings, that the Vikings that came from the north, yeah. you know, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, the, yeah. the Vikings. Uh, we're very proud of what we accomplished but we it's like we don't talk about the bad things the vikings did you know and they plundered and they stole and raped and killed and murdered so we we don't talk about that yeah we always talk about how big we were and how yeah. strong and long hair and i mean take a look at the tv show vikings yeah that's how we see that how sweden looks at Vikings today. Like, yeah. yeah, that's how we were, cool. And we had a cool hairstyle and a lifestyle. And that was so awesome. And then people start to, to start to ask us. But yeah, you, you, you do know that they were kind of, you know, bad people. They were yeah. murderers and they, they it killed just turning people. It up saying, hi, can we borrow your houses and cities for 300 years? Yeah, exactly. It's okay if we take your daughter to this room, there's like 50 of us. Is that okay? No, I don't think they did that. Yeah. No. Uh, we don't usually talk about that. Okay. But we know that it happened. But here on Sabbath on History, we cover yeah. all aspects of the history I know. in I know. the songs. Exactly. Well, Tommy, um, from, from, since I am now a Swede, from yeah. one Swedish pagan to another, 
Thanks for being my guest here. As one of the best guitarists in Sabaton, I'm so glad to have Tommy, who I call Frosty. Insert photo of why. <laughs> so glad to have Tommy as a guest right here on Sabaton History. Glad to be here. Thank you everybody for watching and thank you everybody for supporting and those who don't do it click the bell subscribe and become a patron thank you very much